In order to, uh, you know, disclose how we're going to forge a path to digital asset regulation, and digital assets is a pretty wide topic, where I suspect we'll speak a lot about crypto, uh, I want to set a bit of a context of uh, 2022 and not talk much about FTX, but talk about where we're in the regulatory landscape, um, only to make things even more difficult for uh, my panelists, who are going to each give you a view from their perspectives of what we can expect in 2023 forward uh, so that hopefully we can lay the bones and the evidence of laying or forging a path to digital asset regulation. And so in the major jurisdictions, uh, let's start with number one, MECA. Well, MECA level one uh, draft uh, is in the uh, parliament now. Commission agreed it, parliament agreed it. So we're expecting it to be law sometime in 2024. But post FTX, I think many European parliamentaries, uh, parliamentarians and, and, and policymakers have said, oh, do you, do you think we need to do a bit more on, on this? So I think we really need to watch that space. It is pretty comprehensive. We, we, we think it's you know, a very good piece of draft uh, legislation, but I, I would expect more. Uh, in the U.S., uh, which has uh, been, um, I use the word train wreck, which Jeff Bandman never likes, so let's call it a car crash. Um, in, in the U.S., I think things are a, a, a bit more complex, and we were certainly expecting some degree of guidance on spot market regulation, clearly stable coins, and there's a big FDIC bun fight happening. I just think the signals, and we've heard from Commissioner Pham today in her own words, the, the tea leaves in the U.S. read as if we can expect more enforcement, and then you, you American folks understand where we're in the Legislative Assembly, so I'm not expecting anything to happen or any clarity to come there at all. So I think we in the community and GBBC have our work set out on the education and advocacy front. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll leave out APAC uh, because APAC is still cruising along, but clearly Singapore has become defensive and you know, Maz really led the way. Uh, it's extraordinary to be sitting here and talking about the UK, uh, the number of prime ministers we've had since I first came to Davos with FinTech, uh, the number of prime ministers we've had this year. Um, suffice to say, the UK is back. We've got a prime minister who is uh, pro-technology uh, and pro-digital, We've got an, uh, an economic secretary to the Treasury, Simon Griffith, who's a free marketeer. We've got a, a financial services bill going through, which is the most comprehensive bill in 23 years that's focused on, 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 on digital. And so I think, strangely enough, I wouldn't have thought this four months ago, the UK is going to certainly emerge as a leader, at least a thought leader, in the legislative space, only in that they'll want to do something better than Mika and they'll want to be aligned to the U.S. at some point, wherever they go. <clears throat> These are my opinions. These aren't the GBBC community opinions. And, uh, you, you know, again, I would encourage any of my panelists to say, Lawrence, you've got that absolutely wrong, uh, because that's what kind of an open community we have. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to ask each of my uh, panelists to introduce themselves when I direct the first question at them. And I'm going to start with uh, Mar Mark here, because we've been discussing this. Just give me your comment or narrative from an industry and a consensus perspective, because you've got a pretty wide aperture of what's going on in the market with the players, of what you think 2023 is going to look like and what this landscape is about. Thank you. Um, so l l let me reframe your question just a little bit and say, to get the lay of the land for the path towards digital asset regulation. There's kind of, um, I, I, I like to um, short circuit it and come up with a heuristic. And I think, it, I think of it in terms of the industry, the incentives for regulators of all different types, and the ideas and the idealism of the people in this room and in the industry. So on the industry, um, if you look at the OCC risk report, it says that um, the crypto industry management practices are immature. And we can see that, we can see evidence of that in, in multiple sectors. Uh, even stable coins are not as stable as they claimed sometimes and that contagion risk is high. So fair enough. Um, 
on the incentives for regulators, this is why we'll get to this in a little bit, but I, I don't necessarily think that we're going to see an awful lot of regulation in 2023 um, because the incentives are just misaligned. I see um, lots of misunderstanding about the industry. Um, I see deep pockets of experience in some areas and extraordinarily shallow experience and understanding in others. Um, but when you look at the, the global market cap for crypto, when you look at um, locked value in DeFi, when you look at competing interests for regulators, um, and when you look at the high risk for legislators to take any action, I just see, I, I see the incentives as being all off. And so um, because community incentives are important in our industry, I just looked, I applied that same logic to uh, regulators and I just don't see a lot of movement. I see a lot of recommendations, a lot of uh, guidance, but not a lot of actual regulation. Now the fun part with those uh, two downsides, the fun part is the people in this room, the ideas, and the idealism of a group who, we've talked a, a, around it, I'm surprised um, uh, Shoshana Zuboff's book, The Surveillance Capitalism, I'm surprised that hasn't come up at all, but I would say that a, a lot of us are motivated by a resistance to that surveillance capitalism. Um, I, I just believe, I've seen evidence that centralized finance is in an adversarial relationship with its participants, as opposed to decentralized finance, which is in, um, it provides much more economic agency, and there's a lot better relationship and visibility, frankly. I believe that you're gonna see decentralized protocols and decentralized replicated state machines. They are the foundation of trust for the information age. And after all, um, the well-being of any society is dependent primarily on the inherent social trust of that group. I commend to you Francis Fukuyama's book, Trust. Um, it's, that's where that quote comes from. It's pretty good. Um, you, you raise a few interesting points, and I have to say we've got uh, the person on our panel who knows more about surveillance capital and civil, civil liberties, so we'll get, we'll get around, I think, to maybe unpack some of those things with, with Marta. But I, I, I liked your alignment of incentives, and then, you, you know, I think for, uh, you, you know, us long in the tooth after 2008, when you look at post-FTX, um, where in 2008 we worked out that uh, it was actually uh, the public were the lenders of last resort, um, there is an argument that post-FTX regulators will say, oh my goodness, I mean, what, what, what would we be bailing out in this central model that went wrong, which actually didn't have anything to do with regulation or crypto or, or blockchain or technology, and you know, looks like either malfeasance, nonfeasance, or gross incompetence. Yeah. Sharon, um, what, what, you know, what, what do digital assets present in, in terms of uh, newer issues for regulators in, 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 the, in the broader digital asset landscape? Well, thank you, Lawrence. Um, I'm Sharon Lewis. Um, I'm from Hook and Novels. I head of financial institutions. I head of financial institutions, insurance, and investment sectors, and I co-chair um, our digital asset and blockchain practice. Um, and I have the absolute pleasure of um, being one of our uh, a sponsor of GBCC. Um, Lawrence, you did your introduction. I thought, well, perhaps I should go home <laughs> because um, you've, 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 you've stolen my show. Um, but um, no, I, I want to just pick up first on what Mark was saying about the incentives. And I agree and I disagree. So I agree in that I think there is disalignment. I think that you know, in a post-2008 context, there was alignment, a global alignment between regulators as to at least the need to do something. Um, in 2023, there is clearly not that global alignment as regards a sector which is growing like mushrooms. And I think that that is actually quite dangerous. Um, and um, yesterday somebody said, actually, the, the, the it wasn't even a question of fear. It was that regulators knew that there was something um, but didn't want didn't understand it um, but didn't want to actually admit that they didn't understand it and so therefore 
they were very disinclined to move forward in any in any form and I actually think you know in that context there is a big education piece for um, organizations like GBPC and its members to, to to think about that sort of um, dab literacy um, so that 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 I think is the, the, the first thing but at the same time, um, in a world where there is a cost of living crisis, um, inflation, rising interest rates, I think that governments, and I mean governments as opposed to the financial institution um, system, are going to be very focused on taking out costs. And that actually brings us to the digital world and the digitalization of real assets. Um, I do think that there will be a huge temp temptation and incentive to take out costs, um, be that actually in, um, for example, real estate, you could see that there would be a lot of temptation to put um, real estate and the ownership of real estate on a blockchain. Um, one of the banks I speak to um, believes that that could happen in a period as little as five years. If that were to happen, it would grossly disrupt the way in which we finance real estate. So I think that there's that that's pushing. And I think also, at the same time, um, the same government entities are looking to see how they can better issue into markets. And we are seeing supranational bodies like the EIB testing out um, the issue of security tokens. And I think that other governments will follow. And as governments follow, and these supranational entities follow, there will be more and more temptation for the, re the regulator to intervene and to create frameworks for these issuances. I also think then corporates will follow. And so I do think that there is incentive. I'm not sure that there will be huge um, change from a regulatory perspective in, tw in 2023, but I do want to um, finally just touch on one important act that will be published in the UK in 2023. It's not the Financial Services and Markets Bill, which I'm referencing but actually a smaller act, which is going to be much less contested, which is the Electronic um, Documents Trade Act. Um, today in the UK, um, you cannot possess an electronic document. It is a huge handicap when you are advising um, in this area. And that little act is going to actually make it legal to possess electronic documents like promissory notes, like bills of exchange, like um, insurance policies. And I think that that has the potential to pave a way for a lot of what we're doing, at least in the UK. Uh, and uh, there is the Law Commission's uh, uh, creation of digital uh, objects as a data property class which enshrines uh, digital assets uh, with legal rights in the UK, which is uh, another, exactly, another sort of leaf in that book. Thanks, Sharon. Then for all of you aspiring moderators, I've just blown it, I've failed, I've stolen the thunder of one of my panelists and best friends, so you take note of that. It's a very important learning. Ja Jamie, um, so we, we've got a lot of, uh, you, you know, uh, superstar leaders here. How can we come together and even work uh, better or more effectively with policymakers and regulators to get this alignment issue a bit more on track? Yeah, I th it's a fascinating subject. I think um, the, the ethos from which this industry was born tended to shy away from government uh, it took more of a libertarian stance, I think, as we all know. And so the work 
certainly in the year, early years, wasn't being done to educate, to have those conversations with government and with regulators. But I think we've seen a lot of progress over the last couple of years, um, certainly more and more publicly traded companies in our space which drives a, br a broader conversation, a more active conversation with regulators. We see uh, a number of, of gr organizations springing up. Our operations are in Canada. There are a number of groups we work with in Canada uh, that are engaged in different types of, of lobby activities, working with regulators, working with government at all levels to really educate them on the space, uh, try to get them away from a lot of the FUD that's in the headlines and, and understand what's, what the art of the possible is is um, we want to be able to help shape good regulation because at the end of the day, I think we can all agree that good regulation will help drive further innovation and ultimately further adoption. And it is in the best interest of the industry to make sure that we are um, we're actively engaged in dialogue so that we can help to, to shape the, the, appropriate, um, the appropriate regulation and make sure we're doing the right type of education at all levels of government. And, and, and just to go a bit further on this, are, are we going to uh, start looking at collaborative arbitrage? Because in the U.S., uh, you know, and again, I've got so many great uh, folks in the legal community that have said, you know, stop going and speaking to the regulator now, particularly that we're in this period of enforcement. It's not going to help you at all. So, you know, from your perspective, and particularly from a mining perspective, is it, is it that, you know, gee, let's take the opportunity now and work with the UK policy makers because the doors are open. We, we've got a, you know, we, we've got an opportunity to shape, uh, you know, the le level through the draft legislation uh, going on in Mika. I mean, do, do you have a, a view on where it is we need to focus that well, cooperation? Well, I, I was, I had the opportunity to present last week at, uh, uh, a Milken event in DC and Andrew was there and it was incredible to see how um, how open the UK is to innovation and to this conversation it was a it was a really refreshing uh, change of, of um, sentiment and certainly took me by surprise and that and I know he went on to New York and there's been a similar reception so yeah, I think I think it does serve us to to go where we're welcome and make sure we're having those those conversations where the ears are open. But uh, in Canada, we don't we're, we're not having the same type of discourse that we're seeing in the U.S. And so I do think that this is a very op um, prime opportunity for us to be doing that work and doing that education uh, and having those conversations to avoid the car wreck situation that you referenced earlier happening south of the border. No, no, thanks for that. And it is important. I don't think anybody's trying to talk up the UK here, but ha having, as the CEO of Innovate Finance, which David Cameron established, um, we, we had an open door with broadly a conservative and free marketeering government that was very keen on progressive policy for digital assets. And, and post-referendum, um, the doors have been shut, not just for, you know, fintech, digital assets, financial services, for all of business. And they've opened up again, I think, to, to everyone's surprise. So it is, it is actually energizing. It was, a, I think, the first time any of us had actually been back in Treasury for about four, four, four years for meetings. Marta, um, I, I think, you know, I, you know, I always think, oh, boy, I learned a lot about surveillance capitalism because I, I ran and exited a big data company that was focused on social media, and it was an epiphany for me. It's probably one of the reasons why I'm here. And then I speak to you, and uh, you get my mind blown. But if we look at you know, current regulations and what we can work with, we start weaving in centralized, decentralized, or trust, uh, privacy, all of the things that you do such an excellent job advocating on. What, what, what does the landscape look like that we're trying to forge or, you know, some of the things we can expect coming out of, you know, 2023 and being opportunistic about? Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. So one of the things um, from a civil liberties perspective, um, for me, you know, the, the ethos of this space is really rooted in this idea that you can really import the privacy of cash into the online world. That's that's sort of how we all got here when you rewind to sort of the, the origins of our space. Um, and one thing that we've been seeing um, over the past few years is increasingly governments around the world in the US and elsewhere um, have really been trying to expand the mass surveillance that we see in the traditional banking system 
onto the cryptocurrency space. Um, and you know, I think we're at this really interesting moment in time because in the wake of FTX, right, um, there is suddenly a moment where lawmakers really have an opening to push things that I think are would anyone in our space and and maybe even people outside of our space would see as as really overbearing and frankly, somewhat dystopian. Uh, just to give you one example that I'm concerned about, um, during the FTX hearings uh, in the United States Congress, uh, during the Senate hearing, Senator Warren rolled out um, a bill called the Digital Asset Anti-Money Laundering Act. Um, and that bill is honestly, the, one of the most egregious bills I've ever seen from the perspective of privacy um, and civil liberties. So what that bill would do is two things. The first thing it would do is it would require almost every participant in a blockchain ecosystem to register as a money services business to the point of being completely absurd. It explicitly says, for example, that miners, validators, nodes, um, any, any network participant that has any control over the protocol, that all of these things, including software developers, actually need to register as money services businesses, which means they have to run expensive KYC programs. Uh, they have to um, actually collect massive amounts of information about their customers and customers, right, which doesn't make sense in this context and turn that over to the government by default. Um, and literally, we could not we could not comply with this. The whole point of being a you know a Bitcoin validator, right, is you don't actually know the underlying identities of, of the people whose transactions you're validating. Um, and so it would ab absolutely grind the entire blockchain ecosystem to a halt. And then second, it explicitly says that any of these blockchain network participants that were called out, right, validators, miners, can't interact with any privacy enhancing technology, including privacy coins. Um, so it effectively bans privacy coins um, by banning the ability for any, any network participant, wallets, um, validators, miners, um, from interacting with privacy coins or other anonymity enhancing technologies. Um, so that came directly out of FTX. It has absolutely nothing to do with FTX. It would make the problems with FTX worse and not better. Um, but um, I think that is really, I, I think we really have lawmakers seeing an opening to really expand the surveillance that they've already been pushing year by year in a really big way in 2023. And I think Senator Warren's bill is really just a preview of what we have to come. Uh, I think there are going to be a lot of really important privacy and civil liberties fights this year. Wow. You, we thought you were depressing. <laughs> I, I know. That, thanks, Marta. I you saved me there. <laughs> Well, Marta, let's, let, let's just come back uh, th this way. I'll, I'll finish off with Mark, and then we will open up uh, for questions because you've got a rock star panel here, and I'm sure uh, you've got some great questions for them. So start thinking uh, uh, about them. But you know, so just put this into context for us, uh, and where, where, where is the silver lining, if, if there is any, um, in the context of one of the biggest themes here this week in this community, which is the tokenization of the real economy, uh, where is there existing legislation or, or, you know, where are the things going on in the community that we can, uh, you know, accelerate uh, the work it is that we're doing while we're trying to deal with Elizabeth Warren's, you know, proposed bill? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I really think that oftentimes, and this may be a little controversial, so others on the panel feel free to disagree with me, but I think that one of the things that we often say, um, you know, when we're talking to regulators or lawmakers is, you know, we really want regulation. We just want to be regulated. We want this regulatory clarity. Um, I think that's right, but I think what it does is it really undermines a very important message that I think our community has not been hammering hard enough, which is that this space is already heavily regulated. Um, when you are all of the on-ramps and off-ramps where you're buying and selling and custodying cryptocurrency um, in everywhere around the world, but since I'm a US lawyer, these are chartered banks or trust companies. They're doing KYC. They're doing annual inspections. These are heavily regulated entities, right? Um, and I think we don't emphasize that enough. And I think that one of the main problems with FTX is it makes it seem as though that is not the case. But FTX 
index was um, not a good example of that, right? Um, and so I think that's a really important message for us to hit this year um, as a community is to really underscore that we are actually already quite heavily regulated. And instead of calling for regulation in a space that's unregulated, um, to really talk about specific laws that we want to adapt in a specific way. So I think that the, the, um, the sanctions on tornado cash, it might have the, the, the burden of taking that even further to say now, now we get to um, control protocols and software. That, that has me a little bit concerned. So I'm, I'm wondering what the response to the panelists and of the whole group would be um, to a proposal to say, we're all talking about where, where are we going to get regulation? We want to be regulated. Maybe we're overregulated, whatever. Um, but instead of, instead of waiting, there's so much intellectual power in the industry that it strikes me as strange that we have not taken this into our own hands and proposed something. If, if anyone remembers Stephen Covey, let's begin with the end in mind. Let's say, what 25 years from now, what do we want this industry to look like? And then let's reverse engineer the regulation in order to get us there. I believe that we, we already have the raw materials for that regulation right now. You've got the, the GBBC's Global Standards Mapping Initiative. Um, there's a, I'm part of Christian Carlo's Digital Dollar Project. We've got a paper coming out about the private sector risks for a CBDC. And it actually goes beyond a CBDC too, so um, it's very technically informed. We've got Dow governance papers. We've got tax accounting guidance. So why is it that we could not draft it, and then um, if there's any chess players in the room. So I'm a big fan of um, forcing moves. Forcing moves are moves that you particularly take in order to elicit a particular response from your opponent. I think publishing what we think would be a model crypto, crypto digital asset regulation, I think that would help us get to a place where we're debating what are the reporting thresholds for mixers? What, um, what are the privacy standards instead of, is it a security or is it a commodity? And turf fights amongst agencies. That's your next question, isn't it? How are we going to? I was just gonna say, it sounds yeah. like you've volunteered to start it's a committee. Our new it's our new working group. <laughs> I, I love I'm it. in. <laughs> You're the leader. No, no, but uh, I, you, you know, uh, again, I, and, and this is quite close to your question, any, in, anyway, Jamie, which is how, how can we use existing regulation? And again, how are we going to, how are we going to convene the community to do something about this? And then I, I, I do, I'm inspired by it, so we will reconfigure another uh, community effort to do this. But my own view, having run the GDF regulator forum with over 60 jurisdictional regulators and agencies in it. Having done all of our codes and standards and you know proposed co-reg models is that we've just worked out that regulators have no incentives to do anything, um, and so you know we work with policymakers now, and po po policymakers would just like to know the one or two issues they need to get right. But I, I think that's excellent. But get, you know, Jamie, share with us your views of you know even within the context of current regulations, what what is it that we can do with you know what Mark has presented to to, to move the dial. <sighs> Oh, I don't know. I'm going to have to join the committee with Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Join the committee. Well, I think, so to, to, to that point, though, Lawrence, there, there's, I, I predict it's next year we'll go back. I'll grade myself on my predictions, but I do think that we're going to, we're going to see an awful lot of um, utility of Mika as a template. I think here in the US, because we can't take anything from Europe um, through by whole cloth, we're going to pick it apart. We're going to talk about stablecoin issuance, um, reporting thresholds, uh, market manipulation. We're going to draft more bills along those lines, but we're going to use Mika as a template. Um, I think you're going to see more um, cross-chain illicit transaction scrutiny, uh, but I don't think that's going to result in any kind of legislation or regulation, people will just pontificate about, uh, about it an awful lot. So um, I'm very, at, at consensus, I'm very interested in uh, governance of unhosted wallets. That's why I'm, I'm thinking about this, the, the tornado cash suit, very interested in that. Um, I, I, I believe that MetaMask can be used as identity, it can be used as your Web3 browser, um, or, or you know other uh, unhosted wallets, but 
I think that there are current regulations in existence in the UK um, and in uh, the EU, Mika, and here in Switzerland. I'm, I'm fascinated by this automated reporting standard that they have here in Switzerland that you have proof of ownership of your wallet the minute you do a transaction. And it's automated, um, and, and regulators get to see that. I'm not, I, I'm not so much advocating for that uh, for the rest of the industry, but I do think it's a fascinating technical capability that they've developed. So, so Sharon, uh, last question before we go out to uh, questions from the audience, but let, let, let's shift gears then. And so you and I have been looking at uh, you know, institutional debt issuance, digital assets on chain, you know, the Goldman Sachs stuff, clearly people will be familiar with Project Guardian uh, and, and, and JPM. But in the tokenization of the r real economy and you know, your narrative around the property markets, if we were looking at things like the European debt market, are we going to see a, you know, a, a, a two-speed uh, motorway for digital assets and see institutional issuance move at a pace which is regulated and isn't as encumbered as the, you know, the challenges that we need to uh, address that Mark is raising? I think we are. And I mean, just again, in relation to Mark's comment, whilst you know, I agree, I think that, again, because of the way the world is today, even if we write the standards, the way in which governments are operating in our globe today, you will not get that through 60 jurisdictions. Um, so I think one has to focus probably on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis, which, which is what is happening. So those who want to come to start to play in this space and demonstrate the efficiencies that you can gain um, in this space are doing that in jurisdictions which are more open, where it's easier to do that. So I mentioned um, the problem under English law about not being able to possess an electronic document. That today is a big blocker to really moving that industry forward. Um, in France, um, however, um, in uh, in the early 1980s, and it was Strauss-Kahn, um, they dematerialized bonds. So since the 1980s, when you do a bond issue in France, um, there's no like global bond and you know the temporary global bond, which has to be exchanged for the permanent global bond, which can, in certain circumstances, be trans um, um, exchanged for definitive bonds. There's none of that. There is a simple digital bond um, which is lodged with a CSD and which works. Um, and the same goes for Luxembourg and a number of the other European jurisdictions. And what you're finding is it's those jurisdictions that at the moment are stealing the edge on jurisdictions where it's not quite so easy. But I think that um, those jurisdictions, that I come back to, again, I think that many, many governments, supranational bodies, see the interest of what is being done by the EIB and others, and I think that they will want to follow suit. And I think that that will actually push you know, quite a lot of pe behavior over the, next, over the next couple of years. Yeah, so, so watch the space. Um, does anyone ha have a question? Hi, um, I'm Marina from the European Crypto Initiative. That was the best panel I've seen so far in Davos. So <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> so going back to what Marka, um, Marta and, and Mark were saying, um, my question is, how much does international, um, do international organizations influence those um, regulations? So Mika, AMA regulations, similar regulations, um, we know that IOSCO is now writing reports on DeFi. We have FATF being very active on this end. Uh, and for us working on the EU, we know there is a whole 
AML package in the EU, and very similarly, as you described, we have in the Council's draft a prohibition of the use of uh, anonymous coins and, as they call it, anonymous wallet, which is, um, I think, quite weird because until now they call it self-hosted wallet, so we don't even know what now the anonymous wallets in the Council's draft mean. Uh, but I think there is going to be, as you said, a lot of uh, discussion this year. And my question again is, um, how much can we be independent from those international organizations and in way their reports? Thank you. Sure. You know, one of the things, so for me, I'm an American civil liberties lawyer, right? Um, and so when I look at these particular types of, um, really what we're seeing is, is mass surveillance um, in the financial system, um, for me, I particularly look at it through the lens in America of the Fourth Amendment. And I think that because we have the Fourth Amendment, because we have this prohibition against unreasonable searches and seizures, um, we actually have um, a slightly different bent um, that is much more civil liberties focused. Um, and I'm not sure how civil liberties focused folks in um, Europe would um, look at these types of things. I think this kind of surveillance um, seems to be a little bit more normalized. Um, but in the United States, at least for me, it's sort of shocking that so many of our financial transactions are turned over to the government by default. Um, and the reason that's shocking is um, under the Fourth Amendment in the United States, um, the way that we balance the reasonable uh, needs of law enforcement with the civil liberties of people is that in order to get information about people, right, to read your messages, to see your financial transactions, the uh, the um, police are supposed to have to have reasonable, um, uh, probable cause and go to a judge and get a warrant issued in the United States. Um, and uh, yet somehow um, we have sort of normalized in the financial system this idea that um, there doesn't need to be any suspicion about you for your transactions to be collected by default. And not only will those transactions be collected by default by intermediaries, they will be turned over to the government without a warrant en masse, right? So from an American sort of civil liberties perspective, um, it's really shocking and we, we have some tools as a result in the United States to fight back against that um, in court. Um, and I would also be really interested to learn what kind of civil liberties tools folks might have in Europe. So, so if, I, if I interpret your question correctly, you're, you're saying how influential are international bodies to um, US regulation? Is that what you're asking? Global too. So I, I'll speak to the US. I, I was on Capitol Hill for four years as a staffer, and I will say that particularly in this space, pretty, pretty influential because staffers and members and senators, they are reaching out and grabbing every commentary they can find. If there's somebody else that has a standard, they want to look at it. That's why I think Mika will become the template uh, across a number of different um, potential, we're, we'll tear it apart in the US and create multiple um, pieces of legislation which probably don't stand much of a chance in this environment of passing. But you also mentioned AML. So we had a, an earlier panel that talked about uh, 99 percent being false positives. Let me give you another AML. Um, I, I, I should have said this about the ideas and the idealism of the crypto community, that one of the things that I love very much about it, and all of my colleagues, is that we like form to follow function. I don't want to do something just because it's the way it's always been done. And AML is a big deal. Point, it, um, AML regulations impact, have less than a 0.1 percent impact on criminal revenues. Okay, and um, on the the, comp the compliance costs greatly exceed the the amount of, of currency seized, and don't forget we pay the burden of that cost. Banks and people uh, with delays in accounts um, and false positives. And one and one last point, um, I think that the, we, we need to take. So if we're going to take an action, a regulatory action, it should be against an event, not necessarily a person. Um, when you look at the anonymity and the transparency and the privacy mandates of this industry, I don't really care who you are. If you're speeding on the highway, I'm pulling over a car. I have probable cause to pull you over because of what you've done, not because of who you are. That's, why, that's where I get a little um, sketchy about KYC AML. I, I'm not against it. I understand the purposes behind it. It just seems that what we've created doesn't achieve our own purposes. 
Uh, just quickly, we're going to run a couple of minutes late, and I'm going to get into trouble. Uh, our annual report is out today. Everybody can check it out. Uh, the FSB, the OECD, the FADAF always contribute. And in this community, uh, we do have a lot of influence with global supranationals. Where things come unstuck is at the jurisdictional uh, regulator uh, level, or the conduct regulator, the jurisdictional agencies, which the global ones are typically trying to knit up. And that, that is exactly where, you know, I would say the challenge is, from our perspective, we become an IOSCO affiliate member um, so that we can start working with all of the regulators on some of the themes that we're speaking about. Um, we're going to run a couple of minutes over because we've got two, two more questions. So if we can keep our answer to read that. Thank you very much for a wonderful panel. My name is Nadia, and I work in the uh, crypto space with early stage projects. My question to you is about decentralization. So when I speak to early stage founders, they see decentralization for complete, a very high level of decentralization as a way to avoid or circumvent some of the regulatory scrutiny. How do you view the regulators addressing complete decentralized entities, if at all? Will there be a parallel system where this, this fully decentralized entity navigate outside of the regulatory realm? I, I think initially, yes. I, who, who knows? But I think initially, yes, before we transition to a balance of decentralized uh, entities. Uh, I, <laughs> my one final comment on your question is that intermediaries don't go quietly. Hi there. Um, Azza Iqbal, based in Doha, Qatar. And um, basically, I just advise on regulatory uh, aspects of, you know, co connecting data, connecting, you know, um, the financial sector. I just wanted to understand, can the fiscal aspect of regulation, for example, getting tax on data, can that be an accelerator in getting regulations adopted or not? I'll have a go on that one. I, I, I think my experience as a woman um, is that it took me decades to learn to, that, you know, I like words. Um, one of the reasons I love Lawrence is he, he likes words too. Um, <laughs> but actually, my experience as a woman is that shifting a man and regulators tend to be heavily male influenced um, is you need data. And I think the more data that there is, um, the better you are going to have the chance of winning the argument. Uh, I'd start with the tax. Uh, start with the tax system, and, and that's happened in the U.S. actually as a result of the you know the infrastructure bill. But I, I need to uh, now bring this to an end. My colleagues are going to get very upset with me. We're running over. Uh, can I thank my panelists for the most outstanding contribution you made to this? And can I thank you all for listening and for your questions? Thank you. <laughs>